was a Monday. I came out of a business breakfast in a restaurant on Beverly Drive in Beverly Hills. And I, my mind was full of, I just pitched something, I think the studio are interested, what are my next steps? And there was a man, and he was right in my face, and his nose was maybe six inches from mine, and he smelled bad, and he was dressed in rags, and I noticed that his shoes didn't match, and worst of all, his hand, palm up, was pointing, touching my chest. So I recoiled, I put my hand in my pocket, I took out some dollars, I put them in his hand, I pivoted, I spun, and I strode off to the parking lot. And I sat there in the car, and I was so angry, I had so much adrenaline, I was just pissed at myself. I thought, what the hell is going on here? This man has nothing. I have everything, and I'm intimidated by him? This is just unacceptable. So this percolated around for the rest of the week, and by the weekend, I had decided that this was an opportunity to do something that's worked throughout my adult life really well. If you're scared of something, just do it. Not going to kill you, just push through it. So I got on my bicycle on the Saturday and on subsequent weekends, and I interviewed 65 unhoused homeless human beings, men and women and quite a lot of teenagers. I realized that I knew almost nothing before about what it is like to be unhoused in the city of Los Angeles. I asked them two broad questions. How do you get money? And where do you sleep at night? And the epiphany for me was an old lady. And I said to her, and where do you sleep at night, my dear? And she said, come with me. And she took me by the sleeve and she led me onto the Caltrans land next to the San Diego freeway. And in the bushes, there was a giant cardboard box. And it had been raining and it was damp, and it smelled bad, and it had a piece of blue tarp over the top, and she said, this is where I sleep. And I looked on the side of the box, and it said, Sub-Zero. And I thought, hang on a minute. I have the refrigerator, and this lady has the box. Maybe we're going to bed at night, each of us, what, three miles apart? What is wrong with this picture? So my first thought was, I raise money, it's what I do for a living. I thought, okay, I need to do some research and understand what it would cost to build a hostel for 100 unhoused people. So I got an architect, I got a uh, construction budgeter and a space planner. And we worked out $5 million gets you a 100-bed building, including buying the land, not including operating it. And then I did the math. I looked up. This was just before COVID. There were 65,000 unhoused people in Los Angeles. That was what the national census said. But now I think it might be double that. But let's just say 100,000. Take 100,000 people who need a roof over their heads and multiply that by $50,000 per. That's $5 billion. I raise money, but I have no idea how you raise $5 billion. And in a second thought, I realized this problem will all be dead and this won't have been dealt with. That's just for the county of Los Angeles, it turns out. It's more like two million people unhoused in the United States. So I thought, well, wh wh what are we going to do? This is insoluble. There will never be taxpayer will. Uh, there will never, therefore, be city council. The, the fathers and mothers of the city, very few mothers, I notice, be better if there were more. But anyway, the fathers of the city, um, they'll never 
have the political will to spend $5 billion by raising taxes. Not going to happen. So the thing about being a film producer is when the door of the problem is closed, locked, and you can't get in to solve it, you just don't give up. You go around the back uh, and you see if maybe they left a window open. And so I thought, well, let's start again. Let's reverse engineer this. I thought, we have nowhere to go but up if a person is sleeping rough on the ground. So I tried to invent in my head and to draw this thing. In the daytime, you would push it around. It would be like a big shopping cart, but with lots of pockets and drawers and things. And you put your stuff in it, and you do your recycling with panniers. But at night, you would park it, you'd put on the brakes, and it would unfold somehow into a seven-foot-long cot raised off the ground. I took myself off to the UCLA emergency room. I met with a doctor, and I said, what do homeless people die of? He said, most of them pneumonia in their 40s and 50s. He said, they lie on the ground, they get a bacterium or a virus, it goes into their lungs, they have no medical attention, and then they die. So I couldn't, I have the design ability of a newt. I couldn't design my way out of a brown paper bag. So I thought, where in LA? You know, film producers don't know how to do anything. We just hire people. <laughs> so I thought, where do they design three-dimensional objects? So I thought, where do they design automobiles and toasters and refrigerators? And I found the Pasadena Art Center College of Design. And off I went, got a meeting with Dean Korshek, and I said, if I put up a little prize, could we have a little competition? And he said, we would love that. What do you want to call it? And I said, ah, well, I don't know really what we should call it, except everyone deserves a roof. It's an EDAR. And he said, OK, we're going to have this competition. The two winners of this amazing competition, they had to build them one-sixth scale out of cardboard. It's called a maquette. And the two winners were Jason Zaza and Eric Lindemann. I'm still working in EDAR. He's on the board of EDAR, the charity now. And um, they won. We gave them the prize. And Eric and I went running around, and we found a metal shop. And we said, can you prototype this full size? And they did. And then they did another prototype, and another prototype. Just one more prototype, fifth prototype, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. Pro and at a certain point, this producer said, it's enough. We, we got it. Don't design it anymore. And I went to my friend Jeff Skoll, the man who founded eBay and PayPal, and I said, um, can you give me some money to run a pilot of this? And he said, yeah, I will. So we ordered 50, and then I got the Rand Institute. They said, you can't pay us, so we're not giving you researchers but we'll give you students with clipboards. And so they ran around after we had given away the 50, and they interviewed the end users, and they came back and said, they love these things. This is like a massive psychosocial uplift, it's a shelter uplift, it's a privacy uplift. So then we ordered another 300, and it turned out people see them on the street, they go on the website, they say, oh, this is a really good idea. Let's be clear what this isn't. It's not a solution. If on a 10 scale, an apartment, a nice fluffy bed with a duvet, if that's a 10, and if the old lady in the cardboard box is a zero, on a good day, this is a five. But it is a hell of a lot better than what it replaces, which is a big, shitty pile of bits of tent and tarpaulins and boxes and rubbish and whatever under a freeway overpass. All sorts of things we hadn't thought of. Um, much less NIMBY, not in my backyard. Why? It's got four wheels. We say to the users, if somebody shouts at you, you can go into walking away mode in 30 seconds from being fast asleep. You fold it, zip zap, and you're out of there, and uh, apologize over your shoulder. So um, we have nowhere to go but up. We've got them in San Diego, Las Vegas, Los Angeles. We have them in the San Fernando Valley. 
and on and on and on. And I believe it is a transitional device. It is a way of getting people off the concrete. I had a fantastic moment. Ex-Mayor Richard Reardon, he said to me, you know, we have no f homeless people. You're completely wrong. This was over a dinner. And I said, Mayor, you are completely wrong yourself. And he said, I'm not wrong, I'm right. And I said, no, I'm right, you're wrong. <laughs> and I said, I dare you to sleep in an EDAR on Skid Row. He said, I'll do it if you do it. And I said, yes, and I'll offer another thing. We will have a third EDAR with the largest security guard that I can find. <laughs> and his job will be to avoid the headline that says, EDAR kills ex-mayor. <laughs> so we did it. We counted, he and I, 140 people when it got dark on St. Julian Street who just lay down um, on a piece of unfolded cardboard box. Um, and we reckoned about 40% were women and we thought about 15% maybe were under the age of 18. So what I've come to realize is a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And I think this is it, or at least it's one of them. I think it's not just that we need to make sure we don't have old ladies and single mothers with children sleeping on the concrete in danger with no privacy. I think it's also that this defines us. What actually is the point of a civilization, a city, of government, a country, an organized system for humans to live together if we tolerate what is a huge comment on us, everybody sitting here and me, that there's an old lady living in a cardboard box on the Caltrans land. I believe that this is actually what defines us. It is the weakest link, and what is absurd is how easy it is to do something about it. The EDARs are 800 bucks. That's a whole hell of a lot less than $50,000 per, which I think is unachievable in our lifetime and probably in our children's as well. But EDAs we can do, and on the day that the city fathers and the two city mothers, on the day that they say, well, we've now worked out how to house all of our urban homeless, I pledge that we will gather up all the EDAs, we'll get one of those big road rollers, and we'll crush them, and we'll recycle the metal. And we can all join hands and dance in a circle, and won't it be grand? I wouldn't pack for it. I don't think it will ever happen. What I do believe is that I have found a noble activity in my life which I feel gives me the right to have what I have and to feel good about it. I believe that by helping those less fortunate, we attach ourselves to the life force and we rise up through the, crowd, the clouds of you know, division and rancor and hatred and otherness. We rise through the clouds and I feel every day I do this work that I am privileged to touch the face of God. And so that's it. It's very, very simple. Everyone deserves a roof. This is Eda. Thank you very much. <laughs>